Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin, and I want to thank you personally for tuning in and joining me here today for preaching the gospel. As always, I have my Bible opened here before me, and I look forward to our studying the Word of God together. Won't you take your Bible down at home also so that you can join me as we peruse and as we search the Scriptures, thereby learning God's will for our lives and thereby being strengthened and drawn closer unto Him. Today I want us to study concerning something that has gained a lot of traction over the last couple of decades especially. And that is this matter known as contemporary worship. So often you might see denominational churches which offer contemporary worship at a particular time slot, either followed or preceded by another worship service that would be characterized perhaps as traditional worship. Well, today, as we consider this topic, I don't want to use those characterizations. I, I will speak of contemporary worship, worship that has become more commonplace in our own time, if you will. But we've entitled this study simply this, Contemporary Worship or True Worship, Which Will It Be? Now, you have noticed, obviously, that I'm going to present the viewpoint, I'm going to present the Word of God that I believe will show us contemporary worship in the sense that worship that deviates, that is different from what we find in the New Testament, well, that worship is not true worship. And if that's the case, then obviously we should not be interested in what the world is pushing as contemporary worship, but rather we should be interested, yea, uh, intent as well as contented with true worship. I simply want to do what the Bible teaches me I should do regarding my worship, my offering, my homage, my reverence, and my thanksgiving unto God. How do I go about that? and be pleasing in his eyes. So with these things said now, I would further like to introduce this study by asking basically two questions that will set the groundwork, as it were, for our study. Question number one, we need to be asking this, whose will are we seeking to carry out? When it comes to religion, when it comes to our lives in general, whom are we seeking to please? Do we want to be found pleasing most of all unto God? Are we seeking to carry out, to obey and execute His will, or are we catering to the will, say, of the millennials, a particular generation living among us today? Some would say, well, we, we shouldn't cater to the millennials, but neither should we cater to the golden agers, the older folks, our older brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know what? I would agree. We should be catering to neither one. We should not be seeking to carry out the will of millennials, to carry out the will of golden agers, and for that matter, we should not be seeking to carry out the will of, say, elders or the eldership in the local church from the standpoint or in the sense of worshiping the way that the elders want us to worship. No, wait a minute. Whose will are we seeking to carry out? Whom are we seeking to please? And the answer for both of these questions should be God. We should be most interested in carrying out God's will, and we should always be seeking to please God above all others. If we can please God and please the millennials, great. If we can please God and please the golden agers, great. But we must never insist on pleasing the millennials or the golden agers or any other group 
to the neglect or to the detriment of our pleasing God first and above all. We simply cannot make that compromise. Think about Galatians 1 and verse 10 where Paul says, For do I now persuade men? Am I seeking to win men over to my side or God? Or do I seek to please men as opposed to God being the idea? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Galatians 1 and verse 10. Another passage is 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 23. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. And so these first couple of questions, whose will are we seeking to carry out? Whom are we seeking to please? Those answers are obvious enough. As New Testament Christians, God must be the one whose will we seek to carry out. Now, here's another question to consider. How do we know the will of God? If it's our mission to carry out God's will, how do we know what God's will is? Let's say, for the example, in worship, our current subject at hand. How do we know what God wants for for us or from us in worship? And of course, the answer is true worship is inseparable from his word. The only way that man can know the will of God, thereby being able to accomplish or carry out that will, is by means of God's revelation. It's been revealed in the word. Look in your Bibles at home to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Paul makes this point. He says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? In other words, how do you know what I'm thinking? Who knows what I'm thinking right now? And the answer is, my spirit does. I know what I'm thinking, but how would you know what I'm thinking? Well, you won't until my spirit communicates to you by means of verbal communication most often what I'm thinking. Well, even so, the things of God knoweth no man. We we have no way of knowing what God thinks or what God desires, but by, is the idea, but by the Spirit of God. Verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, Paul's speaking here as an inspired apostle, and he says, look, as an inspired apostle, I have the Holy Spirit of God. And by means of God's Spirit, God can and God has revealed His will to me as an apostle. And so notice picking up or continuing at verse 13, what Paul says there, he says, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual or spiritual words. Now, the point there from the Apostle Paul is this. God has revealed his mind to us apostles and other inspired men by means of his spirit, okay? God, through His Spirit, has revealed His mind or His will to us. Now, we in turn, as inspired men, we have spoken, verse 13, but not in words of man's wisdom, not words that we have chosen or words that we would use, per se, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, the wisdom of God. Through the Holy Ghost, whom we have received from God as apostles and inspired men, he says we're comparing or we're conveying spiritual things, spiritual concepts, using the spiritual words chosen or guided by the Holy Spirit. And so this is a marvelous passage, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 13, showing us how it is that we can know what God wants. God's revealed His will 
through the Spirit to the inspired persons who penned the biblical text. And they wrote it down for us. Now, that being said, let's consider Colossians chapter 3. We're, we're going to be dealing uh, more than once probably today in Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now, that passage is critical for this discussion because it's obviously a passage concerning worship. It speaks of our singing our psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, not only to each other, but ultimately, of course, in praise and worship unto God. But it says there, it ties it there to the Word of God's dwelling in us. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. I want us to understand that when it comes to true worship, the only way that we can know what God's will is, what God wants or what God desires, is we've got to go to the Word. We've got to turn and open the Bible, read and search the Scriptures so that we can know what God wants from you and from me as we render and offer our worship unto him. The word of God is critical. Now, returning to the, the major question at hand. So, if we're seeking God's will, today, is it contemporary worship or is it true worship? True worship, number one, let's consider three major ideas. True worship consists of enlightenment, not entertainment. Let me repeat that. True worship consists of enlightenment, not entertainment. If we're really seeking the will of God in our worship, then, quote, when we go to church, and pardon that expression, but that's how it is typically stated, when we go to church, our desire should not be to go and be entertained or be amused. We're going to be enlightened, to be taught, to be drawn closer to God as a result of our obedience unto His will. That's what worship involves. Enlightenment, not entertainment. The Word of God is central to this. In fact, in true Christian worship, we are being exposed to the Word of God and thereby we're also being exposed to the God of the Word. Consider with me what we find in Acts 20 and verse 7. In Acts 20 and verse 7, the Bible says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Isn't it interesting that this was the Lord's Day assembly? The first day of the week, the uh, infinitive of purpose is clearly stated in the verse. The disciples had come together for the purpose of observing the Lord's Supper. Breaking bread is a synecdoche, standing for meaning the Lord's Supper. They, they had come together on the first day of the week for that very purpose. And while they were thus assembled, what did Paul do? He preached the word unto them. See, true worship, not contemporary worship, but true worship is about enlightenment. It's about learning God's Word and thereby being enlightened by its teachings, by its instruction. Contemporary worship, that, that emphasis is on entertainment. Oh, so often it's a very impressive audio-visual show or even a concert of sorts. 
but it's not spiritually enlightening in the sense that we're not learning and applying God's Word. And that's a critical difference. Another passage, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, Paul would counsel and did counsel young Timothy. He said, preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The preaching of the word is central to the life of Christians. It's central to the life of the local church. It is central or imperative, it's critical to true worship. The Word must be known, the Word must be honored, is what I'm getting at, in true worship. One more passage, Psalm 119 and verse 130. Remember that the psalmist said, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And so when our worship is centered on Christ personally, on the Godhead, when our worship is grounded on the revelation of the Godhead known as Scripture, when the Word of God is the basis for what we do and how we do it, then our worship will truly be enlightening and not merely entertaining. True worship will be that. Contemporary worship, it's a focus on entertainment. Now, consider with me point number two. In the next place, true worship involves emotions, not emotionalism. Emotions, but not emotionalism. Now, sometimes, my brethren, they seem to forget this or they miss this. But true worship is in spirit, meaning it comes from the heart, John 4 and verse 24. And what we need to appreciate about true worship as such is that it is, it is the outflow or the expression of genuine gratitude. Genuine gratitude is at the heart of all Christian worship. Think about how much we have for which to be thankful. In John 15, in verse 13, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, we build on that with 1 John 4 and verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. See, Christian worship comes from a a relationship with Jesus Christ, certainly. It comes from an understanding and an appreciation of what Jesus Christ has done for us or for me as an individual. And thus, true gratitude is fostered. And out of that true gratitude, true worship comes forth. Now, let's go back to Colossians 3. I said we would look at it at least a couple of times in this lesson, and here's a great place to, to look at it once more. Picking up this time in Colossians 3 and verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body, and be ye thankful. Then what we read earlier, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. What's the outgrowth of this? Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus or by his authority giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Notice that in those three successive verses, we, we meet with gratitude every time. At the end of verse 15, be ye thankful, gratitude. 
Then in verse 16, singing with grace in your hearts. Grace there is a figurative expression for gratitude. Then verse 17, do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Three successive verses all deal with this matter of gratitude. What I want us to understand about true Christian worship is it does involve emotions, grateful hearts brimming over, as it were, with love and adoration and reverence and gratitude. Definitely emotions, but not emotionalism. Now, perhaps some of you are seated at home and you're scratching your heads thinking, well, Cliff, what, what's the difference? What, what's the difference between emotions and emotionalism? Well, that's a great question. Emotionalism is the undue emphasis on one's feelings, one's emotions, and especially when that is to the neglect of reason or rational thought and understanding. In other words, if I'm just getting swept up with high emotions and I'm just acting out of emotions, what you have to understand is that actually caters to the flesh. That's really not spiritual. In the Bible, what we see is that man's reason, man's rational thought and understanding, that guides his emotions. In other words, I am emotional. I do have love and gratitude and adoration and reverence toward God. I have all of those very real feelings toward God, but they're based on my rational knowledge of the truth. Always remember John 8 and verse 32. Jesus never said, and ye shall feel the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus never said that. Jesus never said, and ye shall have a hunch about the truth, and the truth shall make you free. No, Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth, rational thought and understanding. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See how, biblically speaking, reason guides emotions so often in contemporary worship, it's swapped around. It's revved up emotionalism that then dictates what a person thinks he knows or what he thinks he understands. When in actuality, his emotions have clouded his judgment, have clouded his rational thought and understanding, and now he's in emotionalism. Well, friends, that might be so often true of contemporary worship, but that is not true of true worship. Now, characteristic number three, and that is true worship will be educating instead of enabling. Educating instead of enabling. We've talked about the Word of God and how the Word of God is the basis for true worship. We've talked about genuine gratitude and how that is at the very heart of true worship. Now, let's bring the two together. The truth of God's Word is what reveals and emphasizes the grounds for gratitude. In other words, if it weren't for the teachings of the Bible, I wouldn't know about the cross of Jesus Christ. I wouldn't know about the awful price that he willingly paid for me so that I can have forgiveness of my sins and so that I can be saved. That stirs great emotions within me, but I would not know that. To have those emotions stirred were it not for Scripture, were it not for the Word of God. And so I think about 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Beginning at verse 1, the beginning of the chapter, Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. 
For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, when I came, I, I didn't base my preaching on uh, eloquent rhetoric or on dynamic speaking or on human philosophy. He says, I didn't do that. I simply preach the message of Jesus. I preach Jesus and him crucified. Now, that, that involves far more than just talking about the cross. Okay, When you talk about Jesus crucified, you also talk and teach concerning that for which he died. And so that, that's a very all-encompassing statement. But the point of the matter is, he says, my message came from God. It was inspired wisdom directing and guiding what I taught, not human philosophy, not the uh, discipline known as rhetoric, not any kind of eloquence or things like that, which would have been my basis. He says, my basis was the Word of God. So the Word of God is what reveals the reason for our emotions. We're educated in what Jesus has done for us, and thereby a rational response is to express our gratitude from the heart with true emotion. We're educated. We're also educated by the Word of God as to how to properly worship, how to properly do that. Truth reveals the prescribed manner that God requires man approach and worship him. That's found in the word of God. That's found in truth. Consider 2 John verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth or whosoever goes across the line, as it were, and does not abide in the doctrine or the teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the teaching of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. So when it comes to our worshiping God, we've got to abide right here. In the scriptures, as it were, God has drawn a line and God says, don't cross over this line. Abide in the doctrine, the teaching of Christ. The word of God shows us not only then why we worship, but the word of God shows us how to worship. Otherwise, if we forsake the Word of God, what will happen is something known as will worship. We will contrive a means on our own, a method on our own to worship God, and it will be according to our own will and not according to God's. For example, in Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, he deals with that. He says there in verse 21, giving examples of some of their uh, man-made uh, restrictions, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after or in accordance with the commandments and the doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. They make a good show in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Paul says this is will worship. It makes a good show of spirituality, but it's not educated in truth. It's not based on Scripture. And so in true worship, we're educating based on Scripture. We're not enabling the sin of will worship. Thank you so much for being with me today, and I hope that we can be together again quite soon.